It's my pleasure to introduce you all today to um, Professor Jonathan Vaknin. Uh, he is a, a professor in the um, in La of Latin American Cultural Studies in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Um, and his research and teaching um, here at the University of Arizona focuses on the cultural production of the Caribbean basin with an emphasis on the relationship between literature and medicine. Um, and he's also uh, currently working on his first monograph provisionally entitled Sick Days, Medicine, Temporality and Latin American Culture. Um, and I imagine we're getting a, a snippet of that in today's talk, which is entitled Illness, Temporal Experience and Latin American Fiction. Uh, so without further ado, I'll uh, pass the mic off to uh, Jonathan, although um, I would remind you, we've been lately finding it works best if during the talk, everyone turns off their cameras. Um, and then after the talk, we'll have a question and answer period in which everyone is encouraged to turn their video back on and to engage Jonathan with questions and comments about his talk. So thank you very much and uh, take it away, Jonathan. Thank you. So I'll start by uh, sharing my screen with you all. Okay. Um, so I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Stephanie and everyone at the Center for Latin American Studies for organizing this event and also for the invitation to come share some of this work in progress. Uh, my talk today, which uh, is titled Illness, Temporality in Latin American Fiction, Severo Sardoy's Fatigue, um, is related to my current book project, provisionally entitled Six Days, Illness, Temporality in Latin American Culture. Um, just to give you a brief uh, synopsis of the book project as a whole and where this talk fits within um, the scope of the project. Um, broadly, the project investigates the different temporal modes opened up and instantiated by the experience of illness, or in other words, how illness alters our embodied perception of time. Specifically, I ask how aesthetic objects might equip us to understand these temporal transformations and how they register the transformations both tra um, formally and thematically. The book, which I'm happy to um, maybe talk more about later during the Q&A, um, is divided into two parts. So the first half focuses on Latin American modernista writing of the late 19th century. And here I analyze in particular um, works by authors and um, artists such as the Colombian Jose Asuncion Silva um, and Cuban poet Julian del Casal in dialogue with um, contemporary European thinkers um, such as Cesare Lombroso and Max Nordau um, who were perhaps infamously known for their work on phrenology and criminology and sort of anti-decadent treatises. Um, so from that part I then shift our attention to the more recent fin de siglo so I jump almost about a hundred years a century uh, and I examine a range of texts from novels and poetry to visual art and film, um, primarily, although not exclusively about HIV and AIDS. And today I'll be sharing the truncated version of the third chapter of the book, which is focused on the work of um, Cuban writer Severo Sardoy, who is pictured here in repose, which I think is an apt image given that my talk is focused on fatigue. <laughs> um, and as Stephanie mentioned, I'm, in, I'm a, an assistant professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and affiliated faculty with um, the Institute for LGBT Studies. Okay. So this talk attempts to glean what we might call an aesthetics of fatigue in the work of Cuban novelist, dramaturge and essayist Severo Sardoy. I'll take as my case study, Pajaros de la Playa, Beach Birds, Sardoui's last novel published shortly after his death from AIDS-related complications in 1993. Set in a clinic that brings to mind Fidel Castro's polemical AIDS sanatoriums of the late 1980s um, and early 1990s, the so-called Cidatorios, which is a play on the um, uh, Cida, the acronym in Spanish for AIDS. The novel, as I'll discuss in greater detail um, at a later point, can be re read obliquely as a meditation on HIV and AIDS. While the clinic's patients suffer from an illness referred to only as el mal, they exhibit symptoms that include skin lesions, which can be read as a clear allusion to Kaposi's sarcoma, 
and most frequently an almost paralyzing lack of energy. Indeed, from the outset, the novel's narrative structure is organized around the oscillation between velocity and movement and stasis and between mobility and paralysis. My argument is that the fatigued body needing to exert maximal force in order to perform the most minimal gesture um, becomes the guiding trope through which Sardoui experiments with narrative time. Just as fatigue slows us down, so too does the narrative curtail our progress, instantiating what in his um, book, The Neutral, Roland Bart referred to as, quote, the endless process of ending. And at a later moment, I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail um, during my talk, but perhaps I can expand on it during the Q and A. Um, I draw on the work of Roland Bart precisely because uh, he and Sardou were actually very good friends um, for many years. And so um, part of my theoretical framework for this chapter specifically uh, draws on their interaction and shows how um, the thought of one figure entered the writing of another and vice versa. And there was a kind of dialogue in their written work. So with that um, introduction, I'll just dive right into the talk. Uh, toward the end of 1991, Sardouille and his longtime partner, Francois Aval, then editor of the French Edition de Seuil publishing house, attended a performance of American choreographer Merce Gunningham's a dance, dance piece, Beach Birds, which had made its debut in Zurich a few months earlier. Set to music composed by John Cage, Cunningham's partner, the piece's opening scene plays on the illusion of movement and stasis, as becomes apparent in, uh, in its first few seconds, which I'll play here. Here the audience beholds 11 dancers in uniform costume. They all wear a white unitard cut across the upper chest by a black yoke, stitched to long black sleeves and paired with black gloves. The dancers' feet are pressed together, their knees are slightly bent, and their arms are extended somewhere between 90 and 180 degrees. At first glance, they appear to be standing completely still. A few seconds into the performance, however, we notice that the bodies on stage are not in fact inert, but are swaying back and forth slowly and listlessly, as if they were hovering in midair or floating on water. The background music resembling a calm ocean breeze, and I'm hoping you were able to um, pick up on this and hear this, uh, resembling a calm ocean breeze or perhaps waves pressing against the seashore, seems to cause the barely perceptible drift of the dancers' bodies. In this regard, the bodies make visible the otherwise invisible movement of air. We can now see how the black silhouette of the costume's chest piece set against the bright white lower part of the unitard comes to life in the shape of the birds to which the work's title refers. The dancer's extended arms are the bird's steady wings and the white leotard their breast. The dancer birds thus appear to be preparing to take off into flight with their wings spread open and their limbs flexed. The music's tempo gradually increases with the addition of a piano, a rain stick, and a violin, and the bodies follow suit, picking up their pace and beginning to disperse in multiple directions around the stage. And that happens immediately after this, um, this short introductory clip, which we saw just now. As Wall remarked after his lover's death, this performance altered the path of what would turn out to be the Cuban writer's final novel. Sardui initially entitled his text, Caiman, Together with his earlier works, Colibri from 1984 and Cocuyo from 1990, the book was intended to complete what we might call a zoological trilogy. Sardui began drafting the novel in the fall of 1990, about a year before attending um, Cunningham's dance and performance. Around that time, he also learned that he was HIV positive. It's um, difficult, if not impossible, to determine an actual date um, just based on his writing. Um, but it was more or less around the time that he attended this performance. By the time the couple attended um, the piece, Walt, Walt tells us, Sardoui had already been experiencing intense spells of fatigue and weakness, signs of the disease's progression. We can't know for certain why um, 
Cunningham's, why the show had so great an impact on Sardouille's project. In Wall's view, the writer was drawn to the ballet's, quote, structure mobile immobile, its mobile, um, immobile structure, or its play, as I suggested earlier, on the oscillation between movement and paralysis. In any case, Sardouille eventually discarded the novel's original title and replaced it with Pajaros de la Playa, an obvious allusion and homage to Cunningham, and not coincidentally, a pun on the, on the Spanish pajaro, which um, particularly in the Caribbean is a pejorative um, term referring to homosexual men. To demonstrate the affinity between the two works, I want to look at the first few lines of the novel. So um, throughout this presentation, I've juxtaposed um, for the most part, all of my quotes in the original on the right, in the original Spanish, and then the translation by uh, Suzanne Gillavine on the left. I'll be reading uh, mostly the English translation, but I'll be switching into the Spanish with a few, um, in the case of a few quotes that I haven't uh, provided the translations for on screen. So the, this is the um, opening chapter of the novel and these are the exact first lines and you could, it really becomes apparent immediately just how um, similar the, the novel is to the dance piece. Quote, the powerful feet of the runners left tracks momentarily on the reddish sand. The, rudder, uh, the runners sped by, concentrating on their exercise as if thinking about each muscle they tightened, absorbed in their daily offering to health. Exaggerated outlines, their taut, almost metallic bodies glistened, varnished with sweat. Wet locks of hair stuck to their skulls. The nudists stood on the highest rocks, raising their tensed arms until their hands touched above their heads, inhaling the pure air, the live air of the shore. Then they began to lower them little by little, expelling the same air now contaminated by the insides of their opaque pulmonary bodies. They were beach birds just before embarking on their first flight, rehearsing their fragile wings, ready to tackle the oceanic whirlwinds. Like Cunningham's ballet, um, actually I should qualify that it's not quite a ballet, but um, it's a form of postmodern dance. And that's something that I was I actually learned recently. Um, so I had to revise that, um, that term. Like Cunningham's piece, Pajaros de la Playa fluctuates between movement and stasis and between speed and slowness. As Wall intimated, and as I will discuss in more detail later, the novel is structured around a set of dualities that ultimately refuse to coalesce into neat syntheses. Against the erect bodies of the runners and the palm trees, we encounter the recumbent nudists lying on the sand. Against the athletes linear race towards a concrete goal, we follow the beachgoers, crooked staggering from the previous night's drunken festivities. Against the quote, daily offering to health, we inhale the contaminated air expelled from the nudists opaque pulmonary bodies. And against the runner's inorganic machine-like physique, we behold the animalistic bathers who commune with the chameleons and by the end of the passage, metamorphose into birds. There is one dyad, however, that inflects the novel's form more than the others. If in this opening scene, Sardoui reinvigorates the early 20th century's pervasive insistence on speed and human machine amalgams, um, and here we might think of um, the futurist writers, or um, this is also reminiscent of what Joyce and Ulysses refer to as the velocity of modern life. He does so in order to provide an acute contrast to the figure that populates the story that follows, the ill and prematurely aging body, nearly paralyzed by fatigue. Indeed, the majority of the characters whom we meet in the novel are identified primarily in terms of their energy levels. In the book's second chapter, the narrator succinctly introduces them as, quote, los que la energía abandonó, the ones that energy abandoned, and, or in other words, the ones who have no energy whatsoever. As my readings will elucidate, the, undul the undulating movement of the patient's bodies within the halls of the clinic, similar to the listless drift of Cunningham's dancers on stage, shapes the rhythm of the narrative itself. The text displaces us constantly from past to present and from the position of the omniscient third person narrator to the diaries and poems revealing a first person speaker's intimate psychic life, all of which lends the novel its hybrid form. Throughout, 
The future looms on the horizon as a nebulous telos that some of the characters aspire to, but which they never attain within the scope of the plot's unfolding. An important point to keep in mind is that the novel never reveals the name of the illness from which the characters suffer. Instead, the narrator assigns it the almost mythic label El Mal, a descriptor that also attributes a moral dimension to the disease. And here we can um, just sort of think of Sontag's writing on metaphor and illness, um, specifically in the case of cancer and then um, HIV and AIDS. Its symptoms include rapid weight loss, which the patients attempt to counter with a host of homeopathic remedies, diarrhea, tremors, skin lesions, and most frequently a debilitating muscle fatigue. At one of the several points in the text where one diegetic level merges with another, we come across the diary of El Cosmologo, the cosmologist, a patient who self-identifies as, um, quote, el historiador de la enfermedad y no solo su víctima, the historian of the, of the illness and not just its victim. Activating the double meaning of historia, story and history, the cosmologist assumes the position of first person narrator in order to detail the patient's daily treatment regimen. Uh, And this excerpt, um, which you can see on your screens, comes from one of the diary entries of the cosmologist. So here's the daily menu, fongamil on the feet and between the toes and diprazone on the sole of the, feet, uh, of the foot, on the knee penicillin, on the testicle baristerol. The different bowls, on one of them there's a seascape, perhaps tropical, which decorates the bowl and distracts one from its content. Hold viscin, neprosol, depakine, malicide, adiazine, Letophiline, Retrovir, AZT, or in its place, Vdex, DDI, Imovain. This exhausting, though certainly not exhaustive, cartography of the body, coordinated around a catalog of bizarre names, might at first appear to be just an additional element comprising the fictional worlds of the novel. And to be sure it is, but it's also something of an historical archive that moves us beyond the text's frame. Some readers might be struck in particular, um, as I was obviously, by the cosmologist's reference to retrovir here, also known as azithromycin or AZT. AZT was originally developed um, by Dr. Jerome Horowitz in the 1960s to treat cancer. Two decades later, at the height of the AIDS epidemic, the drug was discovered to have properties that were thought to be effective against HIV. After a series of clinical trials, AZT was approved by the FDA in 1987 and soon thereafter became a staple of the early drug cocktails of the late 1980s and early 1990s. The treatment, however, was met with um, mixed reactions. For many patients, the drug caused side effects that were tantamount or worse than those produced by the virus itself. And interestingly enough, muscle fatigue was often cited as one of the medication's primary adverse effects. They therefore uh, frequently opted not to take it. As the narrator puts it at an early moment in the novel, it is uncertain whether the source of the patient's general malaise is, quote, el mal en sí mismo, o los paliativos y placebos con que trata de retardarse su progresión. The mal, the illness, in itself, or the palliatives or placebos which, with which one tries to delay its progression. This casual reference to AZT, buried in a list of equally dizzying combinations of letters and names, thus invites us to read El Mal as an index of AIDS, an interpretive gesture that numerous critics have performed. Guillermina de Ferrari, for instance, sets the text against the backdrop of Fidel Castro's Cuba of the final decades of the, of the 20th century. For her, the pentagonal building in which the novel is set it's not quite a hospital, but it's not exactly a, a prison or a sanctuary per se. We don't know exactly how to identify this space. Can be read as a cipher for the Cuban government's controversial policy to quarantine its HIV positive citizens in state run sanatoriums. And I'm happy to expand on that, um, on the history, historical background of that, that practice, perhaps at a later moment. Neither directly named nor totally codified AIDS disrupts the stable division between inside and outside, between hidden and exposed, and thereby challenges both our hermeneutic practices 
and curiously, the logic of exclusion and internment undergirding Castro's quarantines. In other words, what I'm suggesting here is that AIDS operates in the novel as something of an open secret, a kind of neutral figure that shapes our understanding of how the virus circulates within the body of the text and the bodies of its characters. It's worth emphasizing here that what we might call the novel's quote, recessive disclosure of AIDS, and here that phrase is um, Annalise Francoise. Um, uh, the novel's dis recessive disclosure of AIDS is grounded primarily in its use of fatigue as both a formal strategy and a diegetic trope. And let's not forget too, that beyond the world of the story, its author was embodying, experiencing a facet of the reality he was imagining. For now, in order to demonstrate these points more clearly, I, I want to turn to a, key, uh, a few key moments from the novel where the question of fatigue emerges most saliently. At an early point in the story, the narrator details the resident's daily schedule. Regular blood exams check for the presence or absence of El Mal. Attendants arrive at the same time every day to distribute meals and to help the patient's stress. Pills are counted and placed into small cups. And like clockwork, a group of young men, wizened and frail, aged beyond their years, the narrator notes, congregates in the main hall to pass the empty time. The narrative moves slowly from one point in the text to the next, from one step in the process to another, appearing at first to lead us towards some kind of finale. But the cycle repeats itself the following day and the day after that, and so on and so forth until one starts to feel the tedium vitae weighing her down. In this, quote, vasta casona con muros aun solidos y arabescos, the rhythm of this clinical routine, quantified in terms of vials of blood, heartbeats, clocks, and the absolute value of weight measured by a scale, harmonizes with the syncopated steps of the fatigued patients whose every movement poses a Herculean task. I'd like to consider now um, the chapter entitled Y si se tratara de una pura simulación? And what if this were all pure simulacra or simulation? The present scene involves two of the clinic's attendants in Siempre Viva, a resident who had voluntarily moved in with, quote, los que se consideraban como apestados porque eran jóvenes y porque no hay nada peor que la soledad. Those who were considered sickly because um, or infected because they were young and because there was there's nothing worse than so, uh, solitude. Here the AIDS attempt to help Immortelle, so in the English translation her name is Immortelle, but in the original it's Siempre Viva. Here the AIDS, aid, uh, the AIDS attempt to help her take her monthly bath, a banal task that within the space of the ward acquires new meaning. Interrupting her ritual application of blush, creams, and concealer, which apparently serve to hide the signs of aging, the attendants announce their entrance into Immortelle's boudoir. And then we have this scene here. You'll forgive me, declared Immortelle, if I don't soak myself. There are movements I find impossible, almost all of them. It's the fatigue. We're all tired, madam, even the birds. Don't you see how they fall exhausted upon the dome and no longer travel in a straight line? in a single flight to the coast. It's not the same fatigue, Immortelle protested. Mine is otherworldly, as if it had no limbs, something that turns into the body itself, into the air I breathe. Like when you drink rum in the summer and then walk out into the sun. And what's more, added Immortelle, there comes a moment in which there is no difference between oneself and the fatigue. They are, or we are, one and the same thing. I'd like to just read that last part in the original. Y aún más, se añadió siempre viva, llega un momento en que ya no hay diferencia entre uno mismo y el cansancio. Son o somos la misma cosa. Son o somos la misma cosa. In this quick shift between the third person to first person plural, Immortelle enacts the very dissolution of boundaries on which her definition of fatigue rests. For her, Fatigue blurs the separation between self and other, and could even be said to dissolve the notion of self altogether. In the condition she is describing, the body becomes one with its fatigue. Along these lines, Immortelle strikingly proclaims that her, quote, otherworldly fatigue causes the body to vanish into thin air, losing its shape, 
and blending with its surroundings. Immortelle's wariness opens up a world of new connections and encounters. So it's, um, it makes possible new experiences, we could say, instead of foreclosing them. Here, furthermore, it bears noting that tactility becomes the privileged source of relation. The attendant's hands lift her uh, Immortelle's body and lowered into the tomb-like tub. Notice too that the attendant responds to Immortelle's protest by claiming that, quote, todos estamos cansados, we're all tired. This collective we at first seems to bond the employees to the patients over a shared lack of energy. In this sense, the implied nosotros could be said to call into question the self-evident boundary separating healthy from ill which the novel suggests should be understood as unstable temporal positions rather than fixed identities. But Immortelle is sure to differentiate her, her almost transcendental fatigue from the attendant's mere lassitude, where the former seems to preserve something of the separation between self and other, the latter completely undoes it. The distinction between one kind of fatigue and another notwithstanding, what is interesting here is that the attendant's nosotros also includes the birds that every so often crash into the Pentagon's glass dome. Like the mansion's listless residents zigzagging slowly through the halls, the wary birds deviate from their normal line of flight. As will soon become clear, this path also maps onto the one the reader takes throughout the pages of the text. Indeed, on at least two separate occasions, the narrator suspends what he calls the quote, enrevesado relato, the topsy-turvy tale, in order to provide us with a metafictional reflection on the act of storytelling as such. He declares, quote, Economicemos los pormenores que solo sirven para entorpecer la narración derivando hacia lo anecdótico y secundario la mariposeante atención del lector. In other words, I'm paraphrasing here, but let's skip the details, the minor details, which only serve to um, delay or obstruct the narration. Um, shifting the reader's already flighty attention elsewhere. The irony, of course, is that um, up to this point, the narrative and indeed the prose itself have been anything but economical. This moment comes soon after the narrator has already supplied us with an intricately detailed account of daily life in the ward and a meticulous description of Immortelle's ornate Baroque room, embellished with all of the jewelry, old editions of Harper's Bazaar, and vintage clothing she has accumulated over the last several decades. The distracted narrator's abrupt interjection thus succeeds in diverting our mariposeante atención even further away from whatever constitutes the linear action of the plot. In other words, against his own goal, the narrator slows us down even more. He spends time reflecting on the need to get back to the story without actually doing so. To summarize, our slow and constantly inhibited movement throughout the text is analogous to the movement of the fatigued body through the space of the casona. But I'd like at this point to take this um, claim a bit further. The dynamic between characters and milieu, between reader and text, mimics the mechanism by which retrovir, AZT, abates the virus's progression or was meant to abate the, the virus's progression. The drug works by blocking reversed, reverse transcriptase, an enzyme that uses HIV to convert its RNA into DNA and thereby multiply in the host's body. Thus, in curtailing our linear progress through the novel, the narrator appears to enact, if unintentionally, the same kind of obstruction that retrovir is meant to effectuate vis-a-vis -vis the virus itself. We are slowed down, our movement brought to a near standstill, and it is precisely here that we can begin to discern how fatigue, which again was one of AZT's main side effects, shapes aesthetic form. And with that, I'll just I'll conclude with this last comment. Around the same time that he was finishing Pajaros de la Playa, Sardoy also wrote El Estampido de la, Vacu de la Vacuidad, Explosion of Emptiness, a work comprised of 20 short aphoristic meditations on death. In the book's second fragment, Sardoui writes, I'm quoting, my life, I tell myself deliberating preposthumously, has had no telos, no purpose nor destiny has unfolded in its passing. 
Mi vida me digo en un balance prepóstumo. No ha tenido telos. Ningún destino se ha desplegado en su acontecer. He then recants this statement immediately after um, this moment, claiming that his life has in fact had a telos and that this telos is comprised of, quote, a succession of frustrations, failures, illnesses, and abandonments, the repeated blow of God's hand. So Joey curiously conceives of teleology here, not as a kind of linear progression um, geared towards some kind of final purpose or aim, but rather as a cycle a succession of illnesses, the repetition of God's blows. He thus recounts his life's travails from what I'm calling a neutral position, huddled somewhere between the pre and the post, between the past and the future. A mobile yet stagnant present most clearly embodied, as I've suggested throughout this talk, in the figure of the fatigued um, body. And with that, I'll conclude, and I'm happy to take any comments, feedback, questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for that beautiful talk. Um, if anyone has any uh, questions, um, I mean, feel free if you'd like to turn on your uh, video now and you can either put any questions or comments or feedback in the chat window or um, raise your hand uh, and uh, get started. Um, well, if there aren't any, I'll try to get us going at least to sort of break the ice a little bit. Um, but I was just wondering if you could maybe provide, you know, as you mentioned, some a little bit more like context into how this fits in with the broader project. And also, um, you know, you hinted a little bit about uh, the sort of quarantine practices of HIV under Fidel Castro, if there's more sort of uh, ways in which we can see this uh, sort of meditation on uh, on temporality and fatigue in relation to like a sort of, I don't know, the place of illness within this particular moment in the Caribbean or specifically um, in Cuba. And yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, so to address your first point, um, so as I mentioned at the start of my talk, this is what tentatively the third of four, possibly five chapters of the book project. Um, and as a whole, the book looks at the relationship um, again, between temporality and illness and how aesthetic works, aesthetic objects from novels and poems to visual, um, visual art and sculptures and films register that relationship. So basically what the project tries to do is to identify different temporal modes um, that are opened up or instantiated by illness broadly. And of course, within each chapter, I look at specific illnesses and accounts um, and attend to the, the particularities of those experiences based both on the illnesses being represented themselves and the historical moments. Um, so in the first half of the book, I'm dealing with hysteria and, and tuberculosis and um, other rhetorical discursive constructions surrounding degeneracy and decadence. And then the second half of the book is looking primarily at HIV AIDS. Um, so this chapter is focused on Sardui. And then the chapter that follows is um, a sort of comparative reading of an Argentine uh, LGBTQ activist, anthropologist um, uh, named Nestor Perlonger, who um, writes a lot about, or wrote a lot about his own experiences with HIV and AIDS. Um, and I'm juxtaposing him with Cuban American visual artist, Felix Gonzalez Torres. Um, and then in an epilogue, I'm looking at work by Chilean writer, Diamela El Tit. Um, and in each one of these parts of the book, I'm identifying a different temporal mode. So the, this one, this chapter has to do with um, what, I'm, what Sardoui calls the preposthumous. Um, and I, I find that really an interesting way of thinking about this specific temporality that he's inhabiting at this moment, right? It's not, um, death is still the reference within, embedded within that term, but it hasn't yet happened, but it's, it's imminent, right? So I'm trying to use his texts and his writing to understand what that kind of, what it means to inhabit that temporal mode. In the case of Diamela El Tit, um, I talk about or I analyze what I'm calling uh, the chronic terminal, right? Because she has um, a couple stories and a novel about 
a mother-daughter pair, and the daughter refers to her mother as mi madre te terminal. Um, so it's a kind of like terminality, a, a chronic illness that doesn't quite end ever, right? So pretty much throughout the entire project, I'm looking at these various temporal moments and um, how literature and aesthetic objects reflect these modes formally as well as in terms of their content. Um, and your second question had to do with the, the, the sanatoriums? Well, not in particular. I was just, I mean, getting a broader sense of the flow of the book, I'm just wondering whether there, there seem to be these like hints of uh, the ways in which, I don't know, these temporalities of the body and illness like refract through the broader sort of cultural politics of the moment and the place of the ill body within them. Um, mm -hmm. So I was kind of curious whether you're playing with um, sort of the broader sort of, um, I don't know, like currents of history, how people are, are conceptualizing um, like this historical moment or like the, I don't know, there's just ways in which a lot of the language you're using can be thinking about like the telos or lack thereof of history and politics. Mm -hmm. but yeah, that's far. No, I think that's, that's really interesting. And I think um, that sort of gestures into kind of complicated territory when we think of um, the global South more broadly, but the Caribbean as this slow space outside of history or not quite having reached history. Um, and I'm um, drawing on, of course, uh, Chakrabarty, right? And his writing on um, different conceptualizations of history and teleology. Um, I'm trying to avoid that, those debates, and I'm trying to stick uh, more specifically to the kinds of temporal modes that, at least in the case of Sardui, we can um, we can link to the experience of living within a space um, that, in this novel, would be the clinic, the the sanatorium, the sedatorios, um, and how that temporality is associated more particularly with the ill body and fatigue. Although in his other writing, um, Sardui does refer to the Caribbean and Cuba specifically as primarily in terms of slowness, right? Um, we see the reference in the novel to drinking rum and going out in the sun, right? Um, so I would have to think more about that. Yeah. Interestingly enough, <laughs> just to give you some more of the, uh, uh, more information about Sardui's biography, he left Cuba in 1960, so a year into Castro's um, government and never returned. He, he got a scholarship to study in France and pretty much stayed there for the remainder of his life. Um, so that's something I would also have to think about. Great, thanks. Um, so there's um, a question from um, Ali in the chat, um, and I can read it to you so you don't have to. <laughs> uh, but uh, can you please elaborate a little bit more on how the perception of temporality um, has changed through time. For instance, the temporality of this novel and more contemporary novels written in Cuba or any other Latin American country in the 21st century. Thank you. Temporality in relation to illness, of course. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so I would have to think of specific novels. Um, I kind of hesitate to make a broad claim about sort of um, huge cultural phenomena um, within Latin American, contemporary Latin American writing now, but I could compare, for instance, the writing of Sardui to Diamela El Tit, who I mentioned a couple minutes ago. Um, there's something similar happening there. She, in this one novel she has called Colonizadas, it's also based on a short story. Um, she, uh, the novel takes place in what seems to be a hospital, we're not really quite sure, and it centers on, it's pretty much a dialogue between a mother and her daughter, and the mother is living with some illness that isn't quite identified, but it's referred to as, um, she's referred to in terms of her character as my terminal mother, right? Um, but there's a kind of chronicity and ongoingness that's embedded within, within the prose itself, I would say. Um, so even though the narrator of the text refers to the mother as terminal constantly, the repetition of the term almost seems to produce a kind of cyclicality and um, changes our temporal experience. So in that respect, I would say that that novel is kind of performing a similar gesture as the one uh, that we find in Sardoui's text. Um, in the 19, so I'm looking more contemporary texts, I can think of um, 
Samantha Schweblin from Argentina has a book called um, Distancia de Rescate, which was translated into English maybe a year or two ago, and it's called Fever Dream. Um, and that's also set in what seems to be a hospital or some kind of clinic. Um, and it's kind of a very Gothic uh, horror novel, I would say. I haven't, I haven't analyzed that text specifically in terms of temporality, but it, I think it would be interesting to do so. Um, I'm not sure if that addresses the question a bit. Yes, thank you. Thanks, thank you for we have a question from Ilan Philippe. Yes, thank you. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. Uh, thank you. Great talk. Uh, I was uh, I was curious. You know, I, I was not familiar with the, of course, with this author and the other authors you mentioned. But when you said that he had um, he had studied in France and, and you mentioned Roland Barthes as well, you know, I don't know when uh, it made me think about a, a, a French author who published a book, a similar topic uh, in the early 1990s, uh, Hervé Guibert. Yeah. And, and I was curious, you know, especially since you mentioned that connection with, uh, with Barthes, if, if maybe they knew each other or if you were familiar uh, with that work, he, he wrote that book, a very famous called To the Friend Who Did Not Save My Life, à l'ami qui ne m'a pas sauvé la vie. La vie. And in, in many ways, it's I have not read the, the, the novel that you presented, but but a lot of the themes that you are talking about, especially the thing about the sanatorium, mm -hmm. are very really reminded me of that. So I, I, I was just curious about that, if uh, you were aware of any connection, and if you could talk more about the connection with Bart. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. Um, that's a really interesting book. Uh, and it's it's interesting that you bring the book up because it's sort of read as a reflection or a meditation on Guy Bert's relationship to Foucault, right? It's kind of about Foucault. That's um, correct. Right, right? Um, that's what people say. As far as I know, in terms of um, Sardou's own biography, I don't think they met, at least in everything that I've read of um, Sardou, either in terms of criticism or his own writing, I've never come across his name. So as far as I know, they had, they didn't meet. I would imagine that they were in similar orbits, um, right. but I don't think they had met. I would have to do more research to establish that kind of connection. Um, but the second part of your question having to do with uh, Roland Barthes, they were very good friends. Um, and in order, in this chapter specifically, in order to assemble my kind of theoretical framework, I draw on Barthes' uh, notion of the neutral, which he assembles in, in a whole book, which he also calls the neutral. Um, and it's pretty much a list of figures um, organized kind of haphazardly, right? And that's kind of his methodology. And we see that also in A Lover's Discourse, um, where figures that exemplify what he's calling neutrality. And interestingly enough, one of those figures is fatigue or weariness. Um, and he uh, essentially says that fatigue instantiates what he calls an endless process of ending. Um, and he likens it to like a balloon full of air that's slowly letting the air out, but never quite empties, right? And that I think is a really beautiful image for thinking about the fatigued body and its energy levels, right? Mm -hmm. And that's also why in, throughout my talk, um, I make it a point to say that the movement, we can think of the movement in terms of a near standstill, but not quite a full paralysis. And it's that nearness, that not quiteness that I think um, is important to, to highlight here. Um, but in terms of the historical connection or the biography, yeah, they were very good friends. Um, they appear in each other's writings a lot. So Roland Barthes makes a uh, reference to Sardou, one of Sardou's novel in, novels in SZ. Huh. Um, yeah, so they were good friends. <laughs> Great, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to pose a question? Sure. Yeah, Colin. <laughs> I appreciated the talk and it was really interesting to learn about El Mal and, and Cuba and the perceptions there and the temporality. Uh, you mentioned that you'd also looked at Argentina a little bit and I'd be interested to hear uh, uh, some comments you might have about how, you know, El Mal, you know, and, and the temporality and illness played out there in that context. Yeah, so um, to just 
give you a concrete example in terms of what my um, Argentina chapter focuses on. I look at the work specifically of um, Nestor, here I'll write his name in the chat. Nestor Perlonger. Um, he was um, an LGBTQ activist, anthropologist, and also poet. Um, and he's really well known for his poetry, um, specifically a poem called Cadaveres, Cadavers, which is usually read as a critique of um, the Argentine dictatorship of the 70s and 80s, right? But he also has a lot of um, essays about his own experiences with HIV and AIDS and sort of more anthropological um, writing on, on sexuality, um, uh, on gay male um, practices in Brazil specifically because he spent a lot of his time in Brazil. And, and relating to getting to your question about temporality specifically, his poetry is often read in terms of a kind of fluidity, right? It's, um, it, it's exemplary of, um, of a kind of style, aesthetic style that's known as the Neo Barroso. And that's a play on the word Neo Baroque. Um, and it's really, as its name suggests, full of like ornamentation and dense description. Um, but unlike the Neo Baroque, the Neo Barroso sort of emphasizes dirt, dirtiness and um, the sort of like gritty, gritty side of life. Um, so there's a lot of like bodily fluid in his writing. Um, but regardless, I was trying to, I'm trying to show in my chapter on Pierre Longer that against this kind of like unbridled flow that most critics read in his work, I'm also showing in a counter impulse, right? So there's a tendency in his writing to obstruct this kind of free movement. And basically that chapter, the chapter is trying to understand how we can think of this duality in terms of temporality. Um, what does it mean to be mobile and stagnant at the same time? And that's sort of the, the dynamic that I'm identifying in his poetry specifically. Um, in terms of the broader historical context, I think it would be interesting. I haven't done this specifically, but it would be interesting to think about the dictatorship and its effect on temporal experience, right? Um, not just related to illness, but broad, more broadly. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Any other questions or comments on uh, Jonathan's talk? Um, I, I, I sort of have another one popped into my head uh, and maybe it will inspire other questions uh, from people you um, who are getting towards the end though. Um, as I was wondering whether you see, you know, like, um, uh, you know, there's been this sort of shift in HIV AIDS in terms of uh, understanding it as a more acute um, and more rapidly progress progressing disease versus now almost a chronic lifelong condition that actually doesn't necessarily have a different terminal point than other the sort of expectations that other people have of their lifespans um, and quality of life. And so I wonder whether like your, um, you know, if there's a any sort of way in which your work uh, speaks to that sort of changing temporality of the disease itself in relation to like the types of medication um, that are available. I don't know if that then again speaks to much more uh, uh, contemporary, like very contemporary authors and, and their work. But it occurs to me that it's a sort of a particular disease in which the temporal frame of it has sort of rapidly um, changed in the past decade. Um, also in terms of the capacity to prevent it um, through, um, I'm forgetting the name of uh, PrEP. Um, so yeah, I wonder if there's any play with that as well. Yeah, that's that's a really really excellent question. Um, so, my the book project, which is actually based on my dissertation, it ends in terms of year in I think the la 1993. I would say Sardui, maybe 1994, um, is the last year in terms of the the corpus that I'm um, year of publication in terms of the corpus I'm dealing with. But in an epilogue, I do sort of gesture towards the contemporary actual moment, um, specifically in relationship to HIV and AIDS. Just to give you a brief history of um, scientific medical transformations related to HIV AIDS, 1996 really marks 
the beginning um, or the starting point of when HIV AIDS medications became really effective, right? And sort of transformed uh, HIV into what was called a death sentence into a more chronic condition as you um, just pointed out. So I think, yeah, to an extent we do have to, um, I, I, to an extent, I do think the new temporalities opened up or temporal experiences opened up by these new medications do align more with um, a maybe perhaps normative life narrative, right? Where um, the end isn't so imminent uh, or death isn't so imminent. Um, that being said, I do think there there is still, I'm not sure if I would say that because of these medications, there suddenly this notion of precarity has disappeared um, um, or that people living with HIV no longer live on a daily basis with that sense of precarity um, because there still is a kind of routineness, right? The, ha the need to get checked every so often, blood work, there's a kind of like um, habitus that comes about through these new medications, even though living with the condition is no longer the same experience. Um, so instead of thinking in terms of terminality, I, I would agree with you that perhaps we have to think in terms of chronicity. Um, and that's interestingly a kind of, that's often a critique of things like PrEP, right? There almost seem to be a double-edged sword where um, PrEP and also antiretrovirals, where they do extend life, but they also extend life on the basis of having to take pills for the remainder of one's life, right? Or take medications for the remainder of one's life. Um, so yeah, that's a really good, good question. That was a fascinating answer. Um, is if there's anything, is there any other uh, comment or question from the crowd? <laughs> well, if not, um, please uh, join me in uh, thanking Jonathan for joining us and answering our questions. Thank you. Thanks for um, organizing this and thanks for everyone for coming and for your uh, really generative and helpful questions. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.